That was awesome, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, so next, Jason Vaught is going to talk to us about uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Um, Jason is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for a long time. Uh, he is a MFM and an intensivist at Johns Hopkins, and then uh, has done research on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, just like you heard, complement mediated um, or complement role in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, placenta creta. Um, his future work focuses on complement inhibition in health, like we just heard, and cardiovascular outcomes after preeclampsia. So it's an honor to have you here, Jason. Thank you so much for um, the invitation to come here to speak to you all today. Um, I look forward for a future conversation during the discussion of all these wonderful presentations. So first, we're going for some reason it's going down here. So I have nothing to disclose at this time. And when we first introduce postpartum hemorrhage, I think it's first to talk about the definition and talk about what's happening in the United States. So it's the leading cause of maternal morbidity and mortality worldwide. And ACOG actually defines postpartum hemorrhage as an estimate of blood loss of greater than one liter and or signs or symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours after the birthing process. Now what I think is really interesting when you look at the figure to the left is that you'll see that with postpartum hemorrhage of blood transfusions is sharply increasing. And postpartum hemorrhage with obstetric uh, patients with controlled hemorrhage, still increasing, but not as much so. Now you could say that's probably culturally based because we're now getting more you know, comfortable with using blood products during our resuscitation, or it could just be that the postpartum hemorrhage itself is becoming more severe due to placenta accreta spectrum, in vitro fertilization, uh, increased hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and health syndrome. When we talk about anything that, fact, that has adverse maternal or perinatal outcomes, we have to talk about the disparities in medicine. And what we know are that black women are three to four times more likely um, to have a pregnancy-related death to postpartum hemorrhage than their white counterparts. Now let's conceptualize this for a little bit. How does this happen specifically within hemorrhage? So first and foremost, there's economic stability. Do you have the means and the funds and insurance to actually have a doctor, right? Then we talk about neighborhood, physical environment. Are you in a neighborhood where there is a hospital? Are you in a neighborhood where there are, is a lab where they can draw your blood? Education, is someone teaching you about healthy eating habits, uh, iron supplementation, and food resources? Again, you know, at some parts in Baltimore, there are signs on grocery stores, if there's a grocery store in the neighborhood that says, we finally have milk. And then the communication, social context, and then of course the healthcare system. Are you able to be in a healthcare system that can take care of you? If you have a preview, if you have a history of hemorrhage, do you have maternal fetal medicine specialists, hematologists, and other surgeons that can help you within your surgery and or delivery? Going so well on the slide. So, what do we define mo uh, massive postpartum hemorrhage? Massive postpartum hemorrhage is defined as an EBL of greater than 1,500 milliliters or requiring transfusion. If you look at many papers, so a massive postpartum hemorrhage would be uh, equal to like something that meets a massive transfusion protocol. Massive transfusion protocols are defined as needing greater than 10 units of packed red blood cells within a 24-hour period. I think it's really important to note that this is sort of an arbitrary cutoff. Receiving nine units is actually just as bad as receiving 10, and receiving 10 units within one hour is completely physiologically and fundamentally different than receiving 10 units within 12 hours. And then there are other patient factors at play, the patient's weight, height, and other comor comorbid conditions. And then there's something called ultra-MTP, which is greater than 20 units within a 24-hour period. Other uh, estimations of, for outcomes for, a postpartum, for a massive postpartum hemorrhage or massive hemorrhage in general is the critical administration threshold for one hour, which is looking at greater than three units within a one hour period, the resuscitation intensity score, which is greater than four units within a 30 minute period, hemorrhage control resuscitation, uh, which is looking at giving plasma and platelets early to avoid dilution of coagulopathy, and then of course uh, procedures like damage control resuscitation that you would see in trauma 
which pay close attention to hypothermia, acidosis, and quick control of hemorrhage uh, in the setting of abdominal or limb resuscitation and packing. So when we look at master transfusion protocols, many of them are a one-to-one -one, uh, transfusion therapy, which is almost kind of to reenact the, uh, the use of whole blood. The thought process is, and what its studies have shown, is that it reduces coagulopathy, decreases mortality, and decreases morbidity. Um, here is an example of a master transfusion protocol at John Hopkins, where as you can see, it's a six to five to one, or close to a one to one to one, and then they have cryoprecipitate at the third cooler. One thing that is different about the OB master transfusion protocol is that we actually will give um, our cryoprecipitate with the first cooler. Not to mean that it's already thawed and ready, but we start thawing it when the, the master transfusion protocol is called. When we look at the common causes of postpartum hemorrhage, 70% are going to be atonic uterus, or what we call uterine tone. 20% will be trauma. Others will be tissue, like retained tissue, invasive placentation. And only 1% will be coagulopathies or thrombin. So how do we, as providers, manage hemorrhage? One is through uterotonics, such as oxytocin, uh, methargen, hemabate, and misoprostol. There's use of transexamic acid to prevent DIC. There's proceduralization, such as mock balloon placement, um, gel film embolization by interventional radiology. Other surgical techniques within that include DNC, intrauterine tamponade, and compression sutures like Key Lynch. Also, importantly, transfusion is a major part of how we manage hemorrhage in obstetrics. And then, of course, hysterectomy being the final, um, being the final way that we manage hemorrhage. When we look at obstetric stages of hemorrhage, we put them into four stages. So stage one, uh, a blood loss greater than a liter after a C-section or a vaginal delivery of 500 to a liter. It kind of goes through the initial steps of ensuring that there are 16 gauge and 18 gauge IVs, use of your uterotonics, um, talking to the blood bank, uh, determining the etiology. Then you have stage two, which is an EVL of 1500. Again, mobilizing additional help, calling in additional surgeons if needed, um, looking at other types of medications, actually obtaining the cross-matched blood that you've asked for. And then you have stage three. This is when things get very critical. You're really kind of reaching greater than that 1500 ml. You're, greater, you're starting to give the two units of blood. You're mobilizing to the OR. You're actually asking for your uh, other surgeons, proceduralists to be at the bedside. And then you have stage four, which is cardiovascular collapse, which is also kind of initiating this massive transfusion protocol, thinking of ACLS, also to going towards a hysterectomy. <coughs> Again, to reconceptualize the tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin, when you think back as a hematologist, you're kind of like, well, you know, that's really great that I know the ways that obstetricians are managing postpartum hemorrhage but I'm not gonna place the bakery, I'm not gonna do the B1 suture, I'm not gonna do the hysterectomy, so where do I get involved in this? And a lot of times, we kind of get you guys involved with the thrombin aspect. So these are patients that have underlying coagulopathy that may be known or unknown, uh, patients that may be in an intractable DIC, or also patients that may not be able to receive transfusion. So here are some situations where, you know, we've had within our own system where we've had our hematologists be very involved. So one is a 36-year-old patient at 35 weeks, presenting to labor and delivery uh, with sickle cell disease, history of pulmonary emboli, on therapeutic anticoagulation, history of hyperhemolysis syndrome, with anemia, alloimmunization, growth restriction, right? And she needs a C-section. This is not something that we are going to, as MFMs or obstetricians, not gonna call a hematologist about before going back to the operating room, right? The other is a 27-year-old patient, 30 weeks, placenta procreta, meaning the placenta is invading, in this patient it was invading into the bladder. Past medical history, right low extremity DVT, had a right iliac stent placed, full anticoagulation, IV drug abuse, preterm contractions, also gonna get hematology involved at some point. Then we have a 37-year-old patient, placenta procreta, continued bleeding in the OR, greater than 200 units of blood. We were talking last night about this patient, I think this was my first year of fellowship. I think the only surgeon that was not in that o OR was, you know, Dr. James Lamas is an ortho was an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> that was the only surgeon. I mean, urology, trauma, colorectal, you know, vascular, every car you know, cardiovascular. Looking to this patient need ECMO if the lungs go bad from the MTP. 
So, and of course, the one, you know, medicine-based subspecialty that was called was hematology, saying like, you know, is there anything medically that we can do for this patient? So you guys are very needed in this very, you know, unique subset population. So really, what are the main reasons why hematologists are needed? So one is really, I know we talked about all these patients that are willing to receive blood, but there are a lot of pa patients that cannot or will not receive blood. And that's where really bloodless management and a postpartum hemorrhage comes into place. Um, and so that should be a, a non-secular inability to uh, access blood pro products like a Jehovah's Witness, or a medical inability to accept blood products like alloimmunization or hyperhemolysis syndrome. Anticoagula anticoagulation management and postpartum hemorrhage. Not only stopping or reversing, but like when do we restart it? When, do, when is it safe? Um, and we'll really focus on low molecular weight heparin and Coumadin because those are really the only two that are used within, the, um, within obstetrics. And then of course, super transfusion syndromes. So intractable DIC, and also too, we'll touch on some ethical dilemmas in massive or ultra transfusion, ultra, uh, post, uh, ultra hemorrhage. So first, bloodless postpartum hemorrhage management, religious inability. So there are eight million members wor worldwide of Jehovah's Witness uh, faith in the world. Uh, blood or bloodless management programs reduce blood utilization while improving cost and outcomes. These programs give comprehensive plans and options to these patients to better help them decide which product they will accept. Also, too, a really good thing about these bloodless medicine programs are that they are very inclusive of the individual. They are not like, I can't believe you would not accept a blood product to save your life. They, they actually are, they actually have a lot of people on their team that are of that faith or are of that understanding, and they are part of that counseling session. When we looked at an individualized approach to patients that Jehovah's Witness face or people that are unwilling for various reasons or, or not willing to receive blood um, for non-medical reasons, it's not that they won't receive all blood, but they may not receive whole blood. They may not receive red blood cell transfusion, but they may receive things such as um, bovine blood. They may also receive minor factors such as plasmin, albin, albumin, cryoprecipitate, PCC. They may have sealants placed within their abdomen, uh, like Surgiflow or Surgisil. And really in that consultation session, it really teases out what this individual will or will not accept. And that's incredibly important in someone who's not only gonna have a delivery, but a person who's at risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Because you also wanna respect their value and their community value while taking care of them, while giving them the best care possible. When we talk about patient, when we talk about bloodless medicine and patient-centered considerations, we kind of break it up into three places. You have your pre-delivery, your intraoperative, and your post-operative. In the pre-delivery, you talk, you have your consultation, hopefully, and hopefully that consultation is early in the pregnancy. We kind of like to think, oh, we'll do it at 32 weeks. A lot of things can happen between six weeks and 32 weeks: preterm labor, preeclampsia, HELP syndrome trauma, a lot of things can happen. So the minute that you found out that these patients are pregnant, it's really good to kind of have that consultation. Then we start talking about iron supplementation if needed, B12, folic acid supplementation. And then we have intraoperative, the discussion of blood salvage techniques, surgical techniques, um, and adjuncts to surgical techniques. And then postoperative, minimizing uh, phlebotomy and also the use of artificial blood products. Here is just a model that is used for the use of pre-delivery optimization of IV iron and PO iron. And as you can see within this flow chart or within this um, flow that there is looking at the iron status, are they, first, are they anemic? Are they, are they not anemic? Can, will they accept iron? What type of iron is best to be given to them? What other consultations should be done based on chronic kidney disease? And then also to uh, what hemoglobin level do they want them to be at at the time of delivery? When we look at intraoperative considerations, we can look at blood salvage, surgical technique, and of course, adjuncts of surgical technique. So first, let's talk about blood salvage. This is a technique that is used to reduce the exposure of allogenic or donated blood during a surgery. Um, so when we think about this, we can think of preoperative autolog autologous donation, which is basically the patient donates their own blood before surgery or saves their blood before surgery. There's also intraoperative heme dilution and cell saver. Blood salvage, particularly cell saver, can be and should be used in patients at high risk of massive hemorrhage, especially those who cannot accept blood. 
So really cell saver in obstetrics is really not that different than any other specialty with a few key exceptions. So one, we use a lot of lab pads in our ORs, either to cure Todd to the uterus, to compress bleeding, things like that. And so when we use these lap sponges, if we're using cell saver, we should make sure that we put those lap sponges within, or if, you're, if you yourself are doing um, cell saver or talking to your colleagues, make sure they put those lap sponges actually within sterile saline or sterile water, and that sterile saline or sterile water can actually be put into the cell saver and we can get that blood. Because approximately about 100 uh, milliliters of blood can be within each uh, lap sponge. Amniotic fluid should be separated and suctioned within a separate container. This is a theoretical risk. We, you know, Dr. Pacheco is an expert on amniotic fluid embolism, so I don't want to say anything wrong. But the, <laughs> but you know, all of the, you know, nuances of why AFEs happen or who they happen to is not completely well understood. So just to be safe, they say that you should have a suction for your amniotic fluid and a suction for blood. And then, of course, there is minimizing the uh, suction pressure. Uh, the normal wall pressure is 300. Uh, 300 uh, millimeters of mercury for surgery, but decreasing that for your suction, uh, for the suction canister that you're using for the blood to 120 uh, would be good to avoid damaging the RBCs. Cautions to use of cell saver in obstetrics, so active bacterial infection, so someone who already has coriolis amnionitis. If you're doing the cesarean hysterectomy or if you're going back to the OR for a pelvic abscess or a TOA, which th those in themselves can have a lot of bleeding, that might not be a great reason because, again, that infectious risk or if the patient is already bacteremic. Uh, a lot of medications are placed in the surgical field from mesoprostol in the vaginal field if you're using so, uh, cell saver there to uh, porpropane for pain control and also to hemostatic agents in the surgical field. Um, you should be very wary of using cell saver in those situations or you should place those hemostatic agents when you think that your cell saver use, utilization is done. And then, of course, we've all had patients that have had some form of cancer in pregnancy, so cell saver would not necessarily be, um, I would caution its use with use of cancer. So, cell saver, isn't it really costly? Isn't the cost of hospital a lot of money to do it? So, a disposable cost of a transfusion unit is about $100, and the cost of one unit of allergenic cross-match blood is $310. And when we start, and let's just say we just talk about NTP, that's $3,000 right there. And that's not including the plasma, the platelets, the fibrinogen, right? And so again, if you look at a cost effectiveness, cell saver is actually very cost effective. We won't have an, uh, my favorite as, you know, someone who does C-sections or surgeons, there won't be enough blood loss. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, not gonna, <laughs> they're not gonna bleed that much. Um, well, this came out from the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, that actually a blood loss of greater than 500 cc's can actually be useful for cell saver. And the average blood loss for cesarean section is anywhere from 800 to a liter. And so you could argue that every C-section should uh, have cell saver. Is it resource consuming? And that's actually the kicker. It actually can be, a, many hospitals require someone that, a, a nurse that is specialized in use of cell saver. Usually those nurses are perfusionists and they also work in the cardiac OR, so bypass. So I think that's a lot of the barrier for use of cell saver is that it actually can be resource consuming and the resource being the person that's gonna run it. So what about normal bulimic hemodilution? Decreasing blood, and this is basically decreasing the blood concentration when the surgical blood loss is occurring. And then you reinfuse the patient with their own blood. So the way that this happens is, is typically you take one to three units of blood from the, from the patient after the patient goes to sleep or has their epidural placed, right? And you actually reinfuse crystalloid or colloid solution as that blood is going out. So it's almost like blood is coming out through an IV into a bag, you're giving them colloid or crystalloid. And, that, and the aim is to get the hemoglobin to around eight. You start your surgery, and when they start losing blood, you actually kind of reinfuse the blood that they've already given so that they're kind of losing this diluted blood versus their concentrated hemoglobin that they've had from being NPO or what have you. And the ratio is a crystalloid of one, to one and a half to one, and colloid is one to one. So if you take out 700 cc's of blood, you would give about, or 750 cc's of blood, which would be about three packs, you would give 750 cc's of possibly 5% albumin. So the best outcomes are in healthy patients, 
Uh, however, mo are, are in young, healthy patients. However, most of the data is in cardiac surgery and orthopedic surgery. Relative, interestingly enough, even though most of the data is in cardiac surgery, there's a lot of relative contraindications that have to do with cardiac cases. So arrhythmia, acute infections, impaired cardiac function, impaired renal function, a baseline anemia, so a baseline hemoglobin less than 11, inadequate vascular access to perform the normal volumic hemo dilution, and an inability to monitor hemoglobin. The really inter interesting thing about pregnancy is that it kind of already does it for you, right? We already know that a normal volumic hemodilution, or even some would argue a hypervolemic hemodilution, occurs when, you know, during pregnancy. So what we know is during the first, uh, within the second trimester of pregnancy, the uh, intravascular blood volume of a pregnant woman increases by 50 to 60 percent, and that peaks somewhere around 30 to 32 weeks. Um, that peak, you know, the hemoglobin level is anywhere from 10 to 11, so she herself already has accomplished this in preparation for delivery. But again, in certain subpopulations in pregnancy, this can be achieved. And there are case reports utilizing this measure in pregnancies uh, with use of transistemic acid, topical steroid, as, as well as cell savers. And again, this can be something that is especially useful in, in the Jehovah's Witness patient. Again, someone who may not be willing to accept someone else's donated blood, but will be willing to accept their own blood. Surgical techniques. So ways of reducing blood loss. So I will say this, I don't think any surgeon ever walks into an operating room saying, I'm going to be a terrible surgeon today. I'm going to have really bad technique. I'm not going to tie my knots all the way down. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that, like no one, <laughs> We may, we, may, we may walk in tired, we may walk in in a bad mood, but like no one ever walks in thinking like that. But what you have to ask yourself, is the appropriate level surgeon operating? And a lot of times these patients come to academic centers and sometimes you have to say, you know, this is a cheek case, this is a fellow case, this is a two attending case. And so really looking that, at that appropriateness of level. Is all the equipment available? Is a cell saver there? Is, you know, bipolar devices there? Are monopolar devices there? Communication. Is anesthesia aware of the comorbidities of the patient and that the patient will not accept blood transfusions? Has there been a multidisciplinary discussion with the hematology team, with the anesthesia team, with the obstetrics team? Nursing. Does nursing know where the cell saver is? Does nursing know how to facilitate getting the product back to the patient? Surgical text. Are they aware of all of the surgical instruments that may be needed for this particular patient? Whether it's use of Surgisil, Surgiflow, powder, any type of uh, ligation material, things like that. And then clear cutoffs. And this is really where I think for these patients where things can go south for patients that cannot accept blood products. Your cutoff for definitive management, like a hysterectomy, may be very different than someone who will accept blood product transfusions. And a lot of postpartum hemorrhages before we get to hysterectomy, we've gone through all those other maneuvers I listed before especially if it's like an atonic uterus. We've gone through uretonics, we've gone through the arrears, we've gone through the, we may have gone through a bakri, we may have tried to go to IR, but if you know that your patient, that you know they only have two units of their allergenic blood uh, that they've already had you know, done for them, your probably pathway to definitive management may be much quicker. Um, looking at EVL, talking about EVL4 transfusion, right, do you have a higher threshold or a lower threshold? And then also to the option of damage control surgery. So do we just pack the patient and then send her to the ICU to make sure that she remains warm, that she remains like, you know, with, without an acidosis and things of that nature. And all those things uh, should be discussed. Next, we look at oxygen carrier. So this would be someone, could be intraoperative, but also postoperative. You know, hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, uh, usually they're from a mammalian source, which you guys are aware of. Uh, bovi uh, they can be bovine, porcine, or human in nature. Uh, the hemoglobin is separated from the RBCs and is added in a carbon monoxide to reduce vasoconstriction. Uh, and then you have perfluorocarbons, uh, perfluor which to my knowledge is not available in the U.S. When we look at oxygen carriers, um, you know, they can cause a lot, of a lot of adverse problems. So vasoconstriction and hypertension. So this could be specifically worrisome in patients that already have a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, GI symptomatology, uh, immunosuppression. 
there's also increased risk of adverse outcomes. So there's increased risk of mortality and increased at risk of myocardial infarction. So even though oxygen carriers are available, they really should not be your first line. Um, and most would even say that they should be used in times of severe anemia, so our hemoglobin less than five. Here are some of the reversal agents uh, that you know, we were all pretty familiar with uh, that we would use. So for pregnancy, the ones that would be the first three, so warfarin, UFH, and low molecular weight heparin. Here is just kind of like a list of the reversal agents that can be used and the mechanisms of action. And again, we'll mostly focus on protamine sulfate and PCC. So protamine sulfate it is routinely administered in cardiac surgery, so we have really good safety outcomes and safety data in the non-pregnant population. And it's, uh, and it's really optimally used in unfractionated heparin, but can be used in low molecular weight heparin. And the dosage is one gram of protamine sulfate neutralizes about 100 units within six hours. And one milligram of protamine is given for one milligram of low molecular weight heparin, unless it was given within, unless it, unless it was given uh, within the 68 hour time period. And so again, it's a little bit harder to use protamine sulfate in low molecular weight heparin, a little bit easier to use it in unfractionated heparin. Adverse reactions uh, with protamine sulfate, um, vasodilation and hypotension, anaphylaxis and pulmonary vasoconstriction. So really knowing your patient's medical history, like if they have pulmonary hypertension, that might not, and from sickle cell disease, that they may not be the best candidate for protamine result, uh, reversal, not that it's completely contraindicated. Um, there's also um, increased risk of these uh, reactions in patients that have protamine containing insulin and also who have shellfish allergies. Um, but overall, protamine within itself is safe to use in pregnancy. And contextually, you're going to be giving protamine so the patient can undergo delivery. And so it usually is not that much of an issue, right? So the person is fully anticoagulated on heparin, they need to have a C-section. The OBs are asking you to give protamine so that they can do the C-section. So they're probably not going to remain pregnant long after the protamine uh, administration. Warfarin reversal. Uh, we know that we can reverse warfarin with fresh frozen plasma, but I thought that this was a time to talk about the use of unactivated and activated uh, peripheral complex concentrates. Um, one of the more common used one is the un unactivated four factor or what we know as concentra. Um, there are others that can be used uh, such as the three factor, uh, profilinine, and of course there's the four factor activated FIBA. This uh, basically is a graph that I really like that kind of talks about how to administer or the approach to giving uh, four-factor PCC uh, in patients uh, that need anticoagulation reversal. The effects, one of the advantages of PCC that I think for obstetrics over that of giving fresh frozen plasma is that yes, you can rapidly infuse fresh three units or four units of fresh frozen plasma within 30 minutes to an hour, but you risk overload, you risk folly and placo. Uh, PCC, rapid onset within 30 minutes, uh, it's, effic it's as efficacious as, F as FFP, much less volume. Uh, safety in pregnancy is still controversial. It's not recommended unless clearly needed. However, if you have someone that needs to have their anticoagulation reversed, um, that's, you know, that's the case. And it's usually in the setting of a cesarean section, so fetal exposure is low. One thing I will say, which it does require a multi-D discussion probably with cardiology, is that one of the only few times that a pregnant patient will actually be on warfarin um, or coumadin is in the setting of a mechanical valve. And so the risk of PCC with a mechanical valve, you know, you have to talk about that thrombotic risk, um, whether it's theoretical or actual. Last but not least, I wanted to uh, talk about some of the eth ethical co uh, considerations in most and massive uh, postpartum hemorrhage uh, and transfusion. So one is the clinical appropriateness, information and consent of the patient. Again, talking about refusal, is this something that the patient would want? Uh, blood management systems, public safety and justice, meaning if you give so many units of blood, how does that affect the rest of your, not only population within your hospital as far as surgery and needs, but also the city? I think that we forget that when we're using up to 100, 200 units of blood, our blood bank is calling the American Red Cross and they are shifting blood from other institutions to us. And so it really does at some point become a justice issue. There are some papers, there are a couple of papers that have really looked at this on the outcomes and there are a couple of papers that look on the ethicalness of giving more than 40 or 50 units of packed red blood cells to one particular person within 24 hours. 
Um, and this is actually the concept is kind of like this ultra massive frame fusion. Um, this, uh, an ultra massive frame fusion is again 20 units within uh, 24 hours. Uh, there's ethical concerns regarding, again, the resource utilization, blood banks, and really, there's really high mortality with ultra massive frame fusion. And ultra massive frame fusion happens in different settings and outcomes are different for different specialties. The subspecialty that's probably written about it the most or even has started to write about it is actually trauma. Um, so this was a paper that looked at, uh, an observational study that looked at 461 patients uh, that received ultra massive transfusion or at least 20 units of blood. The median age was 35, so again, a lot were trauma, so they're younger. 20% uh, were female and the uh, median BMI was 28. Uh, a caveat here, when we talk about UMT and trauma, the mechanism of injury matters. So 35% were uh, GSWs, 4% uh, were stab wounds, so about a 40% penetrating trauma. Uh, and then you had 38% NVCs, and then 12% were Peets versus automobile, and then the rest were falls from standing, falls from a building, attempted suicide, things like that. The median blood transfused for these patients was 29 units of RBCs, 22 units of FFP, 24 units of platelets, and that was all within a 24-hour period. Mortality was 43% at 24 hours for these patients and 65% at discharge. They, find that they found that you had more risk of mortality or higher risk of mortality if you had an age greater than 50, if you had a blood injury, a hemoglobin less than 11, a lower GCS score, or if you required a resuscitative thoracotomy, which is basically when they open up the chest to cross-plant the aorta. But complications uh, from among the, and the complications among the survivors were AKI, sepsis, and BTE. I think it's also important to note that many people that died within this cohort, they didn't necessarily die from the bleeding. They died because they had ARDS from their, or trolley or taco. They died because they had a traumatic brain injury that was non-survivable. They died because they had shock liver and that was non-survivable. They actually had non-survivable uh, injuries. And they had multiple areas of injury. And that's how come I think that's a really important discussion point when we talk about ultra transfusion and postpartum hemorrhage, which actually I could not find any papers on, which I think would be a really interesting discussion because, <laughs> yeah, because, because we know where the bleeding's coming from in postpartum hemorrhage. It's not a secret. There's not really multiple points. Hopefully there's not a brain injury that's concurrent. And so the mortality I think will be much different. Um, you know, and also too, when we talk about traumatic hemorrhages, um, traumatic hemorrhages, they have high anastomotic leak rates. Like many times, they have a bowel injury as well that needs to be resected, which would not be in a PPH. They have higher rates of pulmonary contusions or ARDS, um, and then they have a lot of traumatic brain injury. So again, I bring up the point of ultra NTT or ultra massive transfusion because I think it's something that we do have to talk about. But I do think, contextually speaking, the patient population for postpartum hemorrhage and the patient population for trauma are very different. So in conclusion, massive postpartum hemorrhage is becoming more prevalent and is a leading cause of maternal mortality. In a subset of patients, hematology experts are needed and utilized to assist in the preoperative optimization, intraoperative conservation, and postoperative manage management of high-risk patients. Um, further, hematologists are important in the management and discussion of anticoagulation reversal of bleeding patients and those about to undergo delivery. And last but not least, I think we as, you know, obstetricians, hematologists, intensivists really need to look at ultra-NTT in pregnancy and look at those outcomes and see what they are. Because there is, I will say, in the trauma literature kind of like saying, oh, once then greater than 35 units or once then greater than 40 units, you know, they're, they're going to die anyway. You need to stop. Whereas the patient that I gave the example of who had greater than 200 units, I'm not saying that everyone should get 200 units, uh, but we are faced with friends and she just walked her son across the field for his final lacrosse game. So I think for them, they would say that that 200 unit is, is needed. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.